our bride going to meet your bridegroom? And what happens when you meet the priest? What does he say to you? This is the body of Christ. And what do you say? Amen. And you? And what is that? That's the consummation of the marriage right there. In sacramental form. I don't want to say symbolic form because it's not symbolic. There is a real communion. There is a real joining. Deeper than the sexual union on a wedding night. Because the living Christ comes and communes with your spirit at that point, and the two of you become one. At that moment, do you understand how that is? I mean, none of us do. None of us do. But we can begin to contemplate some of this by reading this book, because it's revealing to us what's happening in the spirit to us every time we go to Mass. Every, that's why you need to be you going to confession. You've got to make yourself clean, yeah. pure. What if a bride came down the aisle and wearing torn jeans and a ripped t-shirt? <laughs> really? Well, I know it does. <laughs> but shall we say not in polite company? I mean, really. You know what I mean? What would you think? The bride has not made herself ready, right? What does it say in Revelation 19 about the bride? She has made herself ready. How did she make herself ready? Through the righteous deeds of the saints. That is her wedding garment. You see that? Revelation 1 begins with this marriage imagery, and Revelation 19 talks about the marriage of the bride and the lamb. The whole thing in between, what do you think it's about? Marriage. marriage, the wedding, the union, the covenantal relationship that God has established with his people, the church. So that's the lens, or definitely, at the very least, a lens you need to read this book about. And stop getting this idea, it's all about the end of the world, it's all about the end of the world, it's all about the end of the world. That's such a small portion of it. I would argue it's a sub-portion of it. It's a sub-point. The big point of this book is to reveal Jesus, your bridegroom, and his love relationship to you. And what does that lead us into? Well, Revelation 1 opens up with what? A big vision of the glorified Christ. image that John sees in the very first chapter of the book of Revelation. It's Jesus wearing a golden sash, white garments, and he's walking amongst these lampstands. And what's missing in here is the stars in his hand. Let me see if I can find... Ah, oh, let's see what this one is. Ah, oh, this one looks good. Let's take a look at this one. Oop, that's an error. I will skip that one. Let's see here. Obviously, some of these images are better than others. Here's a good one. Oh, I kind of like, I like this one. That's good. I like that. There's how many? Seven, Seven, Seven stars. stars in his right hand. There are how many lampstands? Seven. 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 What is the meaning of the lampstands? The churches. What's the meaning of the stars in his hand? Angels. The angels. The angels of whom? 
that guard the churches that he's going to talk to. Right? Guardian angels to the churches. Let's put it that way. Yes? So this is how the book opens up. It's this marriage relationship, and the first thing that happens is chapters 2 and 3, which are all about what? The message he gives to his bridegroom, the churches. Okay? So we move from Revelation 1 to Revelation 2 and 3, which are the letters to the churches. And Jesus has nothing but nice and wonderful, lovely things to say to the churches, right? Mm. (laughs) What's the main message of this, uh, he says to these churches? Repent. Repent. Five of the seven churches, he tells them to do what? Get it together, people. Repent. Yes? What was the meditation that we did for the rosary today? What, what mystery were we meditating on? Yes. The kingdom. The kingdom of God. Jesus proclaims the kingdom of God. What's the first thing that Jesus said when he proclaimed the kingdom? Repent. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus said that at the beginning of his ministry. Here we are in the book of Revelation, and guess what he's saying? Repent. The same thing. What do you think he would write to the church of St. Charles Borromeo, North Hollywood? Repent. Repent. (laughs) And and what does he say in these notes? Half the time he says what? Oh, sorry about that. Let's take a look through Revelation 2. What's the first thing he says to the church of the angel of Ephesus? I know your work. I know what you're doing. You hear that? Well, that's just one church. Well, to the message of the church of Smyrna, what does he say? I know know your affliction. I know your affliction and poverty. (laughs) To the message of the church of Pergamon. I know where you are living, you're in Satan's throne, yet you are holding fast to my name. Okay? But I have a few things against you. You have some there who are not who are holding to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the people of Israel, so that they would eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice fornication. What does he tell them to do? Repent. Repent. Stop that. The message to the church of Thyatira, what does he say? I know your words. I know what you're doing. Your love, your faith, your servants, your endurance. So he's got good things to say to them, right? It's not all bad, but I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who practices fornication. I will be throwing her into great distress unless they hear that? I'm getting a theme here. Ralph, you talk about repeating yourself. I'm I'm getting to repeat myself here. What does Jesus keep saying to the churches? I know what you're doing. You're doing some things good, but repent. Don't fool yourselves. Jesus would say the same thing to every single church today in one form or another. What about the two? Huh? What about the two? He said repent to five of them, but not two. Oh, uh, the one that he didn't was uh, Smyrna. Smyrna was under such great persecution that they didn't need to repent. They needed to bear up under their suffering, but he knew their affliction. The other one was in, or will be, Philadelphia. Yes. Let's go to the top. So this is four of the seven churches, Revelation 3. Message to Sardis. What does he say? I know your works. I know what you're doing. 
You think you're alive, but... So what did he tell them? Wake up. Hmm? Philadelphia, this is the one that he doesn't give any message of repent. I know your works. I know you have little power, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. See, God knows what, what's going on in each of his churches. And he's instructing these guardian angel churches, these guardian angels to the churches, to keep watch over them, is what I would say. Just like he keeps a guardian angel over each one of us. Okay? Because he's addressing the spiritual needs of the churches. He's not interested in their physical needs. Because the physical will pass away. The spirit will last forever. That's why he keeps telling them to repent. Laodicea, I know your works. You're neither hot nor cold. You're neither, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. I go to Mass, don't bother me. <laughs> right? What more do you want? I'm not murdering anyone. I go to Mass. I go to confession every now and then just to get my wife off my back. <laughs> hmm? I give money to the church. What more do you want? Okay, that's the kind of lukewarmness that I'm talking about. What does Jesus say? You're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either hot or cold. Because you're lukewarm, what's he saying? I'm about to speak you out of my mouth. That's gentle Jesus, meek and mild, talking to you, right? <laughs> oh, just prancing around Jerusalem, healing the sick. Oh, this and this. What does he say to those people that are neither hot nor cold? I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Hmm? See, I've said this before, I'll say it again. God tells it like it is. He's not interested in hurting your feelings. He's interested in for you to, to change. He's interested in you being a faithful, on-fire bride of his church. Got enough people that are just warming pews and not doing anything. You hear what I'm saying? We get this image that Jesus is all nicey, nicey, and this and this and that and that. You haven't read the Gospels if you think that. You have not read the Gospels. Jesus was not nice. I should write, if I were to write a book, I would write a book and the title would be Jesus Was Not Nice. <laughs> A real look at what Jesus did in the gospel because I think we have this stained glass milk toast image that Jesus was just this sweetie sweetie whatever and it's like no he's not no he's not and it and Jesus is reflecting what the father is and if you read the Old Testament God is not nice he is not nice in the way that we would expect. You know, well, sweetie, I know you have a drug addiction, but I, I love you. Please stop. No. You know what he says? I know what you're doing. And if you don't repent, I'm going to take your lampstand away from the, uh, from the table. Do you got it? Isn't that what he says? Well, that's not nice. You're right. Get it? See, we're talking about your eternal soul here. We don't have time or the patience to deal with politi politically correct nicey niceness. We need on fire holy people of God. Period. End of discussion. The prophets weren't nice. That's why they kept stoning them to death. Jesus wasn't nice. That's why they crucified him. Hmm? Amen? Why then are we so scared and timid and nicey-nicey? 
because we've sucked up what the world says that we should be like. That's what. Now, I'm not saying go out and be obnoxious. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. What I am saying is that when it comes to sin, God tells it like it is. Because your immortal soul is in danger if you're flirting with sin. Stop flirting with sin. Give up that relationship right now. That's the message of repentance. Sin destroys your soul. Well, it's only a white lie. No, it's not, honey. It's a lie, and it's sin. Stop it. I know your words. Jesus says that seven times to these churches. I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. And more than that, he knows your heart. He knows where your real loyalties lie. He says this in order for you to know where your loyalties lie. You with me? Okay. So this is the message that comes right after this message. Yes? Well, one thing when talking to people and pointing out these types of things, everyone likes to point out to that one verse, judge not lest ye be judged or take the log out of your own eye. I mean, how do we really respond to that? Because in a way it's true, we're sinners. Yes. But how do we really respond to that? It goes with the idea of speaking the truth in love. It, 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 it's married with that idea. The way I like to present it is this. Uh, the idea of judge not lest you be judged, or the judgment by which you judge others by you yourself will be judged. That's another way of putting it. Um, we're not to, we're meant to be what I like to call fruit inspectors. What does that mean? That means if, if you say you're one thing and yet your life is producing something else, you can judge the effects of what you're doing. You can't judge a person's intent or motive or heart. That much is true. But you can judge the actions and speech that they do. What you did was wrong. Stealing is wrong. Okay? You can judge the actions as right or wrong. Whether they accept that as being right or wrong is up to them, but that's what Jesus